Welcome, friends, and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Bay Roberts Seventh-day Adventist Church, and uh, welcome to our live stream on YouTube. It's good that we can worship together on this Sabbath day. And our sermon title today is entitled, Backfiring Desires. And so we'll get into that shortly. But first, let us read our scripture reading for this morning. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Again, that's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I invite you to join me now as we open God's word and open this sermon time with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you are with us here on this Holy Sabbath day. Father, as we open your word, we ask that you will draw especially close to us as we learn at your feet, as we learn from the oracles of God, your will for us in our lives. Father, I ask that you will be with me, uh, a weak vessel, Father, that you will speak through me, that uh, anything that I have to say will be uh, minimized and everything you have to say will be maximized. We thank you, Father, for your time with us and for being with us and for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So our text this morning in 2 Timothy talks about sound doctrine, and that's really what our message is for this morning. Sound doctrine, exactly what does it mean when you hear those two words, two words, sound doctrine? Well, let's go back to the rebellion of Satan in heaven and ultimately the fall of man. The rebellion of Satan and of man has thrust the creation that we live in into what we would call vanity and folly. Satan tempted man to be as God, to make God-type decisions, and to choose what he thought was best. He first caused man to doubt God's decision and judgment with his questioning to the woman in the Garden of Eden. Now listen to these words. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? When Eve heeded the serpent's voice, the lights actually went out. And when I say the lights went out, sin was about to enter the world. And the whole creation was plunged into darkness, it was plunged into death and decay and despair. God, by the revelation of Jesus Christ and his word, has sought to bring us and all creation back to soundness. The scripture speaks of the importance of sound doctrine. Now let's read a few verses that talk about sound doctrine. The first one is found in Titus, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. Titus is right after 2 Timothy. Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. And the word of God says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And let's just turn over a page to Titus chapter 2 and we'll read verse 1. Verse 1 says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And back in 2 Timothy, go back a few pages to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 
unsound and sound doctrine. Probably one of the best proofs of a real and personal devil is the fact that man is still trying to do things that simply do not work. You know, wouldn't it be crazy if man were still trying to make a square wheel after all these thousands of years? Long ago, he tossed the square wheel into the trash can and opted for the more practical round one. Now, that's sort of tongue-in-cheek, isn't it? But we get the point. Obviously, long ago, he would have done the same thing with many moral issues had it not been the fact of the devil and his blinding and seductive power over mankind. The fact that people are still trying to make adultery, fornication, dishonesty, and cheating work after all these millennia is proof enough that there is a supernatural power of evil influencing humankind. You can see it in the world all around us. Unfortunately, it takes a while to find out that sin really doesn't work. It seems that people in every generation must try sin out for themselves and prove that it is folly. Folly not only to themselves, but folly to those who have been impacted by the sinful action of the individual. In the world around us, we often see a similar process going on as foolish doctrines run their courses. For instance, think of how long it took for the doctrine of communism to run its course and prove itself bankrupt. Now, we know that communism still exists today. Shortly after the turn of the 20th century, there were millions of fervent young people who were sure that communism was the answer to the world's ills. Now, a century later, communism has become a worldwide fiasco that has brought economic ruin on many nations of the world and death to tens of millions, millions under its ruthful and ruthless leaders. Today, there remains little argument about its political validity, although many liberal professors are still enamored with the concept and idea of communism. Things are not always so clearly demonstrated in the spiritual world, however. Let us think about some of our more recent doctrinal follies. Going back to the 1960s, now that's quite a long time ago, but beginning like a flood in the 60s, we were blasted with many philosophies and theologies like do your own thing, free love, LSD, same-sex lifestyles, and on and on it goes. Now many of these doctrines, although seemingly new, were just age-old sins repackaged to make them look more attractive. It is always interesting to watch Satan work to disguise the repulsiveness of evil. You know, folks, in today's world, we see evil all around us constantly, continually, but yet we see it all the time that we get desensitized to the impactful and disastrous effects of sin on the individual. Satan never calls evil by its rightful name. He makes it sound beautiful by using fancy terminology like meaningful relationships, alternative lifestyles, free love, and safe sex. Well, some of the grim results of the last few decades are now becoming apparent. The accounts are beginning to come due from this spending spree of immorality. We are now getting the huge bills for these meaningful relationships and alternate lifestyles, and we are finding that the price is much too high for society to pay. Free love wasn't free after all. We are learning that just as the Bible says, sin destroys the sinner and plenty of innocent bystanders as well. Think how adultery and fornication, for instance, must ripple down through the generations. Even God, in His great mercy, tells us that some sin must be visited upon us, 
even down to the third and fourth generation. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, where God expounds upon this thought even clearer. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, where we will read the truth of the matter. Exodus 20 verse 5 says this, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a what? A jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. It's terrible words, isn't it? Hate, hating God. Many innocent people pay the consequences of sin. David, after his awful adultery, prayed to God to be spared from the blood guiltiness of his act. Psalm 51, 14 says this, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. We can never know the exact toll of emotional suffering, of suicide, murder, and so on, which may result from one evil act on our part. Most dramatic of all is the effect upon the sinner. Now, we all know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Little does the sinner know that the act of sin can sometimes lead to death, and it ultimately will lead to death if we have one ingredient that is missing, and we'll discover that soon. The author of Proverbs speaks of the enticement of sexual sins in this way. Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 27 says, Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. You can't get any more drastic than that. It is not only so with sexual sins, but other sins. The Bible instructs us also that so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which take away the life of the owners thereof. So when we look at the secret sins of the heart and tongue, we see the same thing. The Bible says that a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. These are not my words, folks. These are the words of God. God instructs us with these words as well in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Have you been hurt by coarse words? Have you been hurt by someone speaking ill against you? Yes, I'm sure you have. I know I have. The tongue can be a very evil, evil thing when the thoughts come out of the mouth and hurt the person that they're intended towards. You know, we hardly think today of deceitful speech as something that will kill us. Yet the Bible assures us that it will. Now, one sound doctrine also causes the creation to heave under its evil persuasion. Now, when I say creation, I mean all of creation on this earth. Everything that you see around you, the planet earth, creation. The Bible tells us that as a result of evil in this world, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Creation is groaning to be delivered of sin and of the sinner. Therefore, the Bible assures us that evil pursueth sinners. Now, here's the comforting part. But to the righteous, good shall be repaid. And that's found in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 21. And the Bible declares that tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Romans chapter 2 verse 9. The Bible is clear. You know, it's like the story of a man who robbed a department store and in his haste to escape, he took the up escalator instead of the down escalator. 
No matter how hard he tried to escape, he always was brought back into the arms, the waiting arms of the police. You know, the rebellious and sinful life is just like that. The evil life leads to death, but now and forever, for it says in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Someone once said that we do not break God's laws. Instead, we break ourselves upon them. Yes, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man or to a woman, but the end thereof are the ways of, that's right, the ways of death. Such is the way of unsound doctrine. Now, so far we have heard quite a lot about unsound doctrine, evil surmisings, evil intent, and sinful acts that bring reproach upon God himself. It sounds like a very negative message. And if we left it there, it would be negative. It would just be death. But there is hope. You know, sound doctrine not only works, but it is good for us too. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 13, Moses told the people that if they would keep God's commands, it would be for their own good. God's laws are given for our good, and not only for our good, but for our protection. Let us consider how this operates in some common areas of our lives, which I'm sure everyone here has faced or goes through. Just think of about family relationships, for instance. It is good for children to obey parents, amen? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, the Bible says. It is good also for the parents to assist their children in keeping this commandment. By obeying their parents, children learn the restraints and boundaries that will guide them through the rest of the days of their life and into the eternal life, amen? Many other youth who have problems with authority today because they were never taught to obey. For the rebellious child, the Bible has a dreadful promise in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 17. The eye hath mocked at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. The disastrous effects of unrestraint. And we also have the debate raging in on some churches today regarding the roles of husband and wife in the family circle. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 is often misunderstood and it is often misquoted. Let's read it. Ephesians 5.22 says this, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You know, without a correct understanding of these words, that is why there has been so much debate and animosity and contention along these lines. Without a correct understanding of this verse, there are many who interpret the text this way. Wives, be slaves to your husbands. Now let's be clear, folks. God would never, keep, never advocate anyone to be a slave in the form that we understand today. Here the Lord is simply encouraging the wife to have a deep respect and admiration for her husband. She should encourage him and allow him to be the priest of the home. Allow the husband to exercise the spiritual authority of God intended for him. Her love for her husband in this form, in this form, will bring her ultimate security and happiness. But let's read the last few verses of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 again. Let me read it again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now, let's read the last four words again. As unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Wives, the Lord will bless you abundantly. Now, let's not just leave it there. It's not just about wives. The text goes on to talk about the husbands. What is the responsibility of the husbands towards their wives? You know, it is good that there's balance here. 
Let us read Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If husbands love their wives in the same way that Christ loves the church, his people, and actually died for his people, we could see that there would be harmony in this marriage unit in God's way. Amen? However, this sound doctrine has been misaligned and perverted to mean something that God had never intended. But remember, these new teachings are an attempt led by Satan to make God's word void. Mark spoke clearly on this subject. Mark chapter 7 and verse 13. Let's turn there. Mark chapter 7 and verse 13. Mark chapter 7 and verse 13 says these words, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Now these are the words of Christ. Let us consider now the area of humility. It is good and safe to be humble, but we don't see a lot of humbleness in our world today. The Bible promises us that God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The proud will fall, but the humble will be raised up. The Bible also tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. And we see that all around us again. We could point out numerous other follies of pride in the world. Pride of money, pride of success, pride of celebrities, and the list goes on and on. Pride of self, which is sin. The actual benefits of sound doctrine are many. It improves our health and even extends our lives. The scripture states that righteousness tendeth to life. So he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. So in other words, if you pursue sin, it's unto your own death. And to make matters worse, it's actually your own choice. Obedience to God's law will actually bring us health. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. My son, my son, forget not my law. But let thine heart keep my commandments. It's not the mind, it's not the will, but it's the heart. In other words, it's a heart relationship with Jesus to keep his commandments. The commandments are in his heart. The mind is actually converted. And verse 2, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Now that's something we all want, isn't it? Do we not want peace in our lives? Will we not want long life? Yes, in some mysterious way, the keeping of God's law actually increases our days and years. You know, in a day when health foods are the rage, this simple and practical advice for good health is often overlooked. We see products for health. We see health food. We see health uh, advocates in regards to gymnasiums. We see health exercise. We see all kinds of uh, attributes of health. But we rarely hear that living by the oracles of the living God through his holy word will bring us peace and will bring us health. That is something we rarely hear. I am certainly here not going to preach a certain thing, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Just listen to what it says here. God's law also makes us prosperous. Hear me out. While poverty and shame is a lot of him that refuses instruction, we are told that he that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth what? Findeth life, findeth righteousness, findeth honor. And that's Proverbs 21, 21. And also in Psalm 112, 3 says this, Also wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. I am certainly not teaching here that we all need a BMW in every believer's garage and that God's people should have no trouble or jesting. Because if you look at everyone's life, those who follow Jesus 
and those who don't follow Jesus, they all have trouble and trials to face, every single one. And I'm certainly not advocating a prosperity gospel, but the blessings that come from God in this manner tends to be a lot for the righteous. Finally, God makes us wise. Who is the wisest person that we know of that's found in the Bible? Yes, I'm sure you are saying it together with me. Solomon, what does God's commands say about the wise? In Proverbs chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, the Bible is clear. It states this, Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Verse 10, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto the soul. Sound doctrine makes us secure. It makes us wise. It makes us happy and loved and blessed. And it brings us to eternal life, to joy and to glory. The psalmist says in Psalm 16, verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now, folks, that's talking about our eternal home, our eternal abode. That will be a time, not only a time of reflection, but a time of realization when we walk those streets of gold that as we advocated and lived according to the word of God while in this planet, while this planet Earth was groaning under the travail of sin, it was easy enough to do because Christ loved us. Christ surrendered his life for us. Christ gave all for us that we could live forever with him. The obedience to God's law is vitally important. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. However, we must point out one way in which Christianity differs from Judaism. We do not feel that we can keep God's law. Now hear me through. After all, the law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. And we are not. Jeremiah tells us that the Lord himself will become our righteousness. We feel that now because of Christ. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Or in other words, the Lord's good purpose for us. Jesus is the law fulfilled in each and every one of us. It is no longer that we that live or I that live, but Christ that liveth within us. Amen. Helping us to do that which is pleasing to the Father and leading us ever towards sound doctrine. Step by step. Step by step. Following God's will. Accepting his righteousness in our lives. Allowing Christ to cover us with his blessed robe of righteousness. And then, and then we can keep the law through Christ, not through ourselves. In closing, I would like to read a quote from the book, The Great Controversy, which accurately sums up this matter of sound doctrine and its relation to the Christian. It begins with a quote from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, which is, I'm sure is very familiar to some of us. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, this word, the Bible, it is because there is no light in them. And here's the quote. The people of God are directed to scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of spirits of darkness. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining a knowledge of the Word of God, of the Bible. For its plain utterances reveal his deceptions, that is, Satan's deceptions. At every revival of God's work, the prince of evil is aroused to more intense activity. He is now putting forth his utmost efforts for a final struggle against Christ and his followers. 
Let me go through one sentence in that quote. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men, and when the word is used men here, it means men and women, all humanity, from obtaining a knowledge of the Bible. Now, folks, when you look at the world around you, when you look at what's going on in the world today, do you not see this happening in our work, in our world? How often do you see or hear the word of God pronounced? How often do you see that sinful desires take the ultimate place outside of a thus saith the Lord? It's all around us. It's all around us. Everywhere we turn. In our world today, our world today is certainly in turmoil at every turn. I would like to leave you with this thought. May we hold fast. May we hold fast to a thus saith the Lord. These words of life will change you. It's a promise. It's a promise found in his word. Open its pages. Read its words. Take the counsel from the word of God on how to study the Bible. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Look through the word as for hidden treasure. And you know something? When you desire to know God's word in your mind, in your heart, in your lives, God is faithful and just to live within you, to reveal to you the preciousness of his word. And it will bring to you a closer, living, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, your Savior. And you will love to spend time with him. And you will see that the world around us is but folly. Follow Christ. Follow him. And you will have peace. You will have health. And you will have eternal life. Make that decision just now. As we pray, make that decision to follow Jesus the rest of the days of your life. And he will bless you. He will bless you. Let us pray. Father, I am reminded of the words found in Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. But at that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, having keep kept it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We're thankful, Father, that even though we live in a world of sin, a world of dismay, a world of hurt and sorrow, your word brings forth life, it brings forth joy, it brings forth peace in our souls. As we walk through these, through these dark pages of history, we realize that Christ is still there. Christ is still there working to move upon the hearts of men, women, and children everywhere. The time is short. The time is now to make a decision before Jesus comes to take his faithful home. I know there are many listening and watching right now who in their hearts want to follow you, want to commit their lives to you. We just need to pray these words. Father, forgive me. Forgive me for my past way of sin. Father, help me to draw close to you. I invite you into my heart to change me, to guide me, to live within my life so that I may be set free, so that I may have peace and follow you. For Lord, you are love. You are compassion. You are victory. And Father, we thank you for this time together. Be with us now as we leave as we go our separate ways, that, and we can rejoice knowing that we have been with Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this Sabbath day. In your precious name we pray. All the brothers and sisters said, Amen and Amen.